And the broadcast is live, we will. Uh... Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Galaudius, on behalf of uh, uh, Cyberpower of Tigray. I will be the host, and uh, it was a pleasure having you one more time again. Uh, I think uh, this discussion is uh, very important, especially in the highlights of uh, what's going on in Tigray. Uh, if we don't know our past, uh, we are not going to be able to predict our future. So it is a uh, an important tool, history, uh, to uh, present our service in the light of uh, these difficult times. And thank you so much uh, for enlightening the youth, especially the youth in the diaspora. It is very important for them to connect to the motherland or to the fatherland. Which way? Either so, way. Either way, you know. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, they have done so much uh, in this difficult time, uh, reaching out uh, to many audiences throughout the world. And uh, I think uh, your input is valuable because uh, now they will have uh, even much uh, greater participation in the future of their country. You know? uh, so uh, let's hope, let's hope, you know, uh, that history where we came and where we are going. Uh, and uh, we'll continue the discussion that you already started uh, from 16th century up to this stage. Uh, uh, different rulers, uh, uh, is there a military junta? <coughs> we have seen those feudal uh, 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 militarist ruler, rulers in, in Ethiopia. And there is something, a lesson that has to be taught. And you try to summarize it uh, social, uh, political, and economic. So, uh, what do you think in the light of uh, this? How do you summarize uh, the current, especially the current? You, you have started uh, going through uh, 1600 so quickly uh, up to Abiy Ahmed. What is peculiar about this regime as opposed to? His predecessors. predecessors. Okay, that, that's uh, really good. And uh, thank you, Ato Barakat, for hosting tonight. And I would like to extend my gratitude to Ephraim uh, Mesfen, who is actually the owner of the Cyber Power of Tigray. He's been doing a good job in terms of communicating with the young uh, Tigrans, uh, most of whom are born and raised in the diaspora. And uh, I am always uh, uh, delighted to teach my diaspora young people so that they know their roots. Once they know their roots, they're gonna know their direction. Unless you understand history, you cannot go forward. As simple as that. So although we're gonna do a summary of uh, uh, the 20th century uh, Ethiopian history vis-a-vis -vis Tigray, it's gonna be more of analysis uh, so that they can have a, a deeper knowledge of what happened in that part of the world. Uh, I have done this uh, in other programs like the Tigray uh, Communities Forum. We used to teach them Tigrinya and their culture and their history so that they know. Uh, but due to COVID and other, and then on top of that, the war came into Tigray beginning last year. Uh, and we had to really uh, postpone that program, but they've already started now again. So I'm going to continue teaching in that program as well. So we're going to use this uh, opportunity tonight to uh, uh, give them some information to our young, but I wouldn't mind other people included in here as well. Although we're focused on the, on the, uh, on the, on the young, blood 
that uh, others can also join us. It doesn't matter anyway. So if we begin with Emperor Haile Selassie, who actually reigned, uh, he was the longest reigning monarch in the history of Ethiopia from 1930 to 1974. So we're talking about four, 44 years with interruption of the Italian invasion. Uh, otherwise, he was the longest reigning monarch. You see, he was, he was actually exiled between 1936 and 1941. When he came back with the help of the British, uh, who were also members of the Allied forces during the Second World War. Uh, in two years after he came back to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, there was a rebellion in Tigray. This rebellion in Tigray is known as the Kadamai Kadamai Wayane, the first Wayane. The first Wayane uh, agenda uh, included equality and justice, and of course, uh, of course, graduating from poverty as well. But uh, the, 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 the national anthem was uh, uh, the flag of Ethiopia is our flag. So they were actually uh, they were actually fighting the system. They were not fighting Ethiopia really. The Kadamai Wayane. But uh, the emperor who was really new after five years of exile was terrified by the movement in Tigray, and he was out to destroy the Kadamai Wayane. Uh, he was not very equipped. They didn't have the military uh, uh, power uh, either to simply defeat the Wayane. So he needed the British uh, help and he got the assistance from them. The British Air Force from Yemen, which was the colony of uh, the British, came from Yemen and bombarded Magale. Okay, this is the Kadam Wayane. So even during the first couple of years of the reign of the emperor, Tigray was bombarded. We have now, we have the, the, the Barakat, you are very familiar. You grew up in that city. You know the grave-like uh, structures in the center of the city that symbolize actually the bombardment of the 1943 uh, first Wayani. After that, really, uh, the emperor uh, viewed the Tigrayan people as uh, uh, people who can challenge his, uh, his uh, legitimacy to power. As a result, uh, he actually uh, did not do much to develop Tigray. He did not even do much to develop the whole of Ethiopia, as a matter of fact. I give him some credit in terms of uh, expanding schools, but uh, the uh, schools were concentrated in Addis Ababa, in Harar, and uh, after Eritrea joined Ethiopia in Azumara. Uh, so he did not do much to really develop Tigray. Tigray was impoverished during the entire reign of the emperor. Uh, anyway, the emperor uh, was uh, deposed in 1974 by the revolution, the Yekatit revolution in Ethiopia. And the military took over then. Actually, the military literally hijacked the movement of the people. And then there were so many uh, organizations like uh, like Mason, like EPRP, and then the TPLF emerged in due course in 1975. The Tigray People's Liberation Front started its struggles in Tigray, opposing the Derg, of course, the military government. And it took like 17 years uh, to fight the military government. After that, the Derg was defeated by the TPLF as well. But the TPLF, similar to the uh, emperor, 
also bombarded so many towns in Tigray. It completely burned and bombarded housing that we all know. They were actually more cruel than the emperor in terms of bombarding Tigray. But at least uh, to some extent, you can say, well, it's a fight. There was fighting going on in Tigray. During the emperor, there was not that much fighting. The Kadamai Wiyani was a small group, really. And of course, uh, the military government stayed 17 years in power, and it was also eliminated by the TPLF. This time, the TPLF had to join other Ethiopian groups and form the EPRDF, Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, and they entered Addis Ababa in 1991. And Mengistu Haile Mariam, uh, uh, the leader of Ethiopia, president of Ethiopia, and chairman of the military government, had to flee <laughs> Addis Ababa to Zimbabwe, where he is now. Yes. And then we see now EPRDF as uh, uh, the new government of Ethiopia from 1991 to nine, 2018 until the coming of Abiy Ahmed. 27 years in power. So I have, uh, have uh, authored a book entitled uh, Ethiopia Democracy, Devolution of Power and the developmental state. In that uh, book, I have given credit to the APRDF for their foundational economy contributions. They did excellent job in terms of transforming Ethiopia economically. Uh, infrastructures, uh, roads, all Ethiopia was connected by roads during the APRDF. And then with the railway system, no railway system from Djibouti to Addis Ababa, and no light uh, rail in Addis Ababa itself. Addis Ababa is completely transformed the city. Nazareth, Awasa, Awasa were completely transformed as well. During the APR day, we had uh, like uh, 50 universities unheard of in the history of Ethiopia. They've done very well. But in terms of uh, 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 in terms of establishing a political culture, a democracy, the APR uh, did not do well. I criticized them in my book. They should have done that as well. They didn't democratize. Uh, they came up with the most brilliant constitution, and the constitution allows freedoms and what have you that they were incarcerating journalists. They were putting uh, 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 political leaders of certain parties behind bars, which was completely wrong. So that is it. In 2018, of course, the uh, predominance of the TPLF was eliminated as well because a new government emerged led by Abiy Ahmed. Abiy Ahmed actually came out from the womb of the APRDF. Without the TPLF and the APRDF, Abiy Ahmed could not have assumed state power, not at all. But he became the number one enemy of the TPLF. He became not only the number one enemy of the TPLF, he is now the number one enemy of the people of Tigray because he is out to destroy the people of Tigray. Remember, this uh, double-faced uh, leader went to Tigray in the formative period when he came to power and told the Tigrayan people that they are golden, that they are full of rich history and blah, 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 blah. Now he's destroying them. <laughs> Wanton destruction of Tigray by bringing the Eritrean troops, the Amara militia, and uh, the United Arab Emirate drones. 
for one small state, regional state, they bring all these forces. So, uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed is the number one enemy of the people of Tigray. But I believe ultimately, uh, despite all these sacrifices uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, current disadvantage of the people of Tigray, I think the people of Tigray are going to be victorious. Uh, that's what I believe. So, in short, this is what it looks from 1930 to 2018. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I hope uh, our listeners are benefiting uh, from your uh, rich uh, historical uh, analysis and uh, historical background. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, success, successive regimes uh, starting from Azim and Alip, uh, up to Abi Ahmed has done so much damage to the people of Tigray uh, in terms of uh, you know, war, destruction, poverty, and so on. Why are we as a Tigrayans cannot take this lesson to prevent such disasters uh, when we can? <laughs> Why is that? I mean, is that... What kind of mindset? You know, sometimes I wonder, you know, this is just keep happening. Yeah. What are we going to, you know, understand? Is that something that uh, we are so optimistic, we don't look back and uh, things will be better? And I don't see anything that's getting better. It just, uh, you know, keep happening. Just keep happening. Why is that? I mean, as a historian, why is that? Is that, are we denying what is happening <laughs> to us? I mean, is that a denial? I, I, I'm so curious. I mean, <laughs> let's think about it. Yeah. What is happening? And it's just repeating all this atrocity. It happened during the Battle of Adwa. Loot, rap, uh, destruction. And I see a deep the same what's happening right now, even in larger, even much, much, much worse. I mean, rap and all those things have been there. And it was not documented well, uh, especially uh, what the Minilik uh, soldiers, uh, savage soldiers has done to Tigray. Is that lack of documentation or uh, something else? What is your understanding as a historian in terms of uh, analyzing uh, what's happening to us. Yeah, okay, this is it. Uh, uh, see, uh, the thing is, uh, we should really, you brought up a very good point. Uh, but uh, always, if you really want to understand history, you got to put it in context, in context. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Tigray and the Shoah, the Amahara Shoah, had always been rivalries in terms of controlling state power. If you see the relationship of Emperor Rehans and Emperor Manilik, you can see all these intrigues, all these manipulations, all this what have you. Okay? So, uh, uh, Emperor Rehans was. Uh, after Tewedros, the real architect of uh, modern Ethiopia. But uh, he, he, he had a lot of problem with Emperor Manilik. Manilik uh, was siding with the Italians. There was a certain Antonelli in Addis Ababa who was counseling him. And uh, because the thing is power, state power, capturing state power. The, the, they don't really give uh, that much uh, importance to the welfare of the people, okay? So if you see it from that point of view, when before before Adwa, before Adwa in 1896, uh, there were already famine in Tigray, but it got worse because uh, thousands of uh, troops came along with Menelik. They were dependent on the people of Tigray. It was 
this, <laughs> I mean, the thousands of people, can you imagine? And then on top of that, uh, uh, a tax, some certain tax was imposed on Tigray, on the people of Tigray. And the people of Tigray said, we're not going to pay it. Uh, and this was a challenge to Emperor Menelik. He didn't like it. Therefore, he wanted to punish the people of Tigray as well. Okay? So it's a long story anyway. Uh, what we can do now is uh, we have to begin to understand modern Ethiopian history, not only in terms of, 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 of uh, uh, certain regimes, behaviors, but also on what we as a people have done. For instance, have the Tigrayan people uh, learned their lesson from their past experience? You see, that's what we don't question most of the time. Um, uh, the TPLF, for instance, uh, won the war in 1991. Then it created a charter in Addis Ababa uh, where it invited other groups to join and form a new government, a transitional government. Uh, it did not forecast the consequence of that. And they stayed in power for uh, how many years? 27 years. Uh, uh, they almost forgot to cry in those 27 years. They had good relations with the Amahara and the Oromo and others. In fact, those who benefited most in the 27 years are the Amahara elite and the Oromo elite, really, not the people. Amahara elite, and they were in power, most of them. There were very few Tigran ministers, very few. Of course, in the army, there was a sizable Tigran people, generals. But in, in the bureaucracy, in the Ethiopian bureaucracy, the majority were Amahara and Oromo. And then Nazareth, Awasa, and Bahardar, and others flourished incredibly. Tigray was forgotten. So sometimes we have to criticize ourselves. We cannot criticize the system all the time. We have to admit our weaknesses as well. And then if you remember Abu Barakat, the Badma War came, where Ethiopians were united for sure. After Badma, we did not learn from that experience too. We could have wiped out this goddamn Eritrean president sitting in Asmara, who is now destroying Tigray. That was a moment that was missed, a historical moment that was missed by the TPLF and the EPRDF. They could have wiped him out, okay? So, so many chances actually we missed, so many of them. And then even after Abi came, after Abi came, you can see the symptoms of anti-Tigran. It's okay, we always say November uh, the four, uh, four, uh, last year, the war started. No, as far as I'm concerned, the war against Tigray started in 2016, when thousands of Tigrans were harassed in the Oromia and Amahara region, when thousands of them had to run for their life from Gondar, if you rem remember, they were burning their property and everything. So many Tigrans were killed, and the government was not saying anything. It was an anti-Tigran movement. This is long before the declaration of war in Tigray. So you have to learn from that too. Okay, they are doing this. If this is an anti-Tigran movement and the government, sitting government doesn't say anything, ultimately this uh, uh, government is going to do uh, uh, much greater harm to Tigray. You have to say that. They did not do it. They were not prepared. And then came, of course, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not surprised that Eritrea is involved in the war in Tigray because Abi, uh, Abi, it's not just Abi. Abi is just uh, a little uh, uh, 
diabolic guy. The big diabolic guy is uh, Isaiah Sapporke. He always had said that he doesn't want to see Tigray developed. What does that mean? What does that mean? Even when the, there were this, I remember this uh, uh, certain projects like efforts, effort projects like the cement factory at Mosabo, and then the pharmaceutical industry in Adograt, the textile industry in Adowa. Uh, you know how Isas defined them? He said, these are like missiles looking onto Eritrea. Missiles. These are economic projects that he called them missiles. And then one day also he said, uh, the, before the Badima war it was about to start, he said, we're going to finish this Tigrayan people with fleet. Fleet actually is the one that he used to kill flies. Now he is using <laughs> bombs actually to eliminate the Tigrayan people. So, so these people are talking all the time, anti-Tigray thing. So you have to learn from that too. We did not do it. We did not do it until the last minute. They were not prepared, okay? Okay, nobody would expect the United Arab Emirates drones. But the thing is, Abiy Ahmed was terrified by the TPLF. And he said, unless I eliminate these guys, I'm not going to stay in power. And they challenged him too, many times. Okay, constitutionally. They challenged him many times. So he is going to bring any force from anywhere to destroy not only the TPLF, but the people of Tigray. See, so, so we have not learned from, from history. We have not learned from history, okay? That's the problem. Yeah, I, I do agree on you, Anna. This is, uh, uh, there is, a, uh, I know the box falls uh, somewhere in the leadership. Uh, I don't know in what state of mind they were, but as recently as I heard the interview of uh, Duarede and uh, also Rikibe, General Migwe and also um, uh, three of the generalists, uh, and it really uh, uh, mind-boggling that uh, in all directions that we were surrounded, uh, I know quite sure Arab Emirates was not in the equation to, you know, even predict. Uh, but also, the diabolical leader is an opportunist. Uh, uh, that he will be engaged in a full force uh, uh, to submission to Tigray. Uh, you know, as I have said it in many times, they want to take us 100 years back. And uh, with the resilience of our resilience of our people, we came up to this challenge. Mm -hmm. We paid so much uh, sacrifice, and still we are paying so much sacrifice. And uh, the economic structure and all those things, uh, you know, it is a great loss. But a much greater loss is a life that we cannot rebuild. It's one small loss. Our heart bleeds in every occasion when we think about what if, what if, have we done this? Could we have prevented so on and so on? But we are into it now. I think history is going to judge uh, very, uh, very seriously in what happened. And uh, we'll leave it to the historians, uh, just uh, uh, educated intellectuals like you. Uh, one thing that really uh, want to ask you is uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed, uh, the current, uh, his political fiasco lies against the whole world. I mean, you know, the whole world is talking. Genocide is taking place. Starvation is taking place. Systematic starvation is taking place in Tigray. Rape and also the loss of uh, lives, loot, what not. Uh, as a professor, uh, uh, a renewed professor on uh, TMS, Tigray Media House, uh, I think uh, the guest was uh, uh, Melissa uh, from Denver. Uh, she brought uh, a professor, Lakishi, is a famous uh, known 
genocide activists and humanitarian. Uh, he says there are uh, 10 stages of uh, uh, genocide in the world, and the Tigray ranks number nine out of 10. And that means that it is an annihilation of the whole, the whole uh, Tigrayan people from their land, which you have seen in Western Tigray and other parts of uh, also in uh, Raya and other parts of uh, settling in Amhara. Uh, Amhara's population. Uh, what I'm trying to ask you is, is uh, uh, how do we, how do we see in the light of all these difficulties uh, that the world is acknowledging, but it's not moving, you know, uh, forward to stop this madness. What could we done? What? what we could have done better than what we are doing right now. Okay. And also, I want you to also answer the, you know, the file that we shared together about the uh, Finland uh, former prime minister that uh, uh, he had given testimony in European Union that some of those global Ethiopian officials, I mean, they don't even have that diplomatic tone to say that they are going to wipe out the Tigrayans from the flood. <laughs> and it's it just, what kind, I, I don't know, I don't have any word, but you understand what I have to, to say. Yep, 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 yep. But anyway, uh, Mr. Barakat, you know very well of my writings and uh, we've shared so many things with you for the last 25 years. No? And uh, if you remember, in 2010, I had to respond to one uh, gentleman, American, by the name Gregory Stanton. Gregory Stanton uh, was lecturing a small Ethiopian audience in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that small audience is... Uh, 100% uh, uh, Amahara, unfortunately. I'm a Pan-Ethiopian, I used to be a Pan-Ethiopian, Pan-Africanist, which I'm not gonna, in principle, support even today. But unfortunately, we have gone separate ways. Then he tells them, uh, he was talking about uh, a massacre that took place in Gambella. And he says, the TPLF is gonna be responsible for that massacre. Okay, he can do. He can, he can say that. Well, what am I going to say? He can criticize the TPLF, maybe. Although he doesn't have any evidence on the Gambella massacre, then he says, continues by saying, massacre, genocide can also come to the people of Tigray. I was shocked. This person to say to hear that this person say that. And he has a project called uh, Preventing Genocide Project. <laughs> what a contradiction, contradiction in terms. Then if you recall also, Shalak Adawit used to say all the time, I've been to Rwanda, I have an experience of genocide and this Tigray people, 6% of the Ethiopian population Blah, 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 implying, not directly saying genocide has to happen in Tigray, but implying nonetheless. He was talking about Rwanda and Tigray at the same time, and then belittling the people of Tigray as 6%. The people of Tigray have contributed so much to the making of Ethiopia, to the Ethiopian civilization, so much. Who confronted the Turkish forces, who confronted the Egyptians, who confronted the Italians, who confronted the Mahdists. It's the Tigrayan people, really, who made a lot of sacrifice. Not only for Tigray, but for all of Ethiopia, actually, really. So this Dawit and others should have actually, really, give, given credit to Tigray. They should have actually, really, really, instead of going against Tigray, they should have really appreciated what the Tigrayans have done. 
but that was not the case. And then if you recall the so-called Usat, narrow-minded people, television, they were always talking about eliminating the people of Tigray. At one point, they even said, we need help from Eritrea to attack Tigray. <laughs> and they always talk about Ethiopia and all those things. Abstract Ethiopian nationalism, which is fake, fake nationalism, really. If you are a genuine Ethiopian, you wouldn't attack Tigray. Never. But these are chauvinist elements who only do have their own narrow interests. They don't care about Tigray. But the reason I'm bringing this now is we were not making preparations when Stanton was talking, when Dawit was talking, when the Assad people were talking. You see? When they were doing all these things, he got to make some preparation. On the part of the TPLF, they should have armed 90% of the people of Tigray. They should have armed them. They could have defended themselves. They did not do that. If Abiy Ahmed is militarizing the people and others using Amhara militia group and others, why can't you arm your own people? You see, we did not do that too. So we were at a loss, at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the enemy, okay? We did not do that. Mm. So this is a sad affair anyway, you know. So there was lack of preparation on our part, but uh, sometimes uh, 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 you cannot predict the course of history all the time. So this is what happened. Uh, now, of course, it's a different story. I heard today that uh, the Tigray Defense Forces have actually attacked uh, the Eritrean and the Ethiopian Defense Forces. Uh, there were great losses on the Ethiopian Defense Forces and on the Eritrean side. So it's highly possible the uh, the shift, the power is going to shift in the, and the military power is going to shift in Tigray, maybe in the coming couple of weeks or so. But the one that he brought, the Finnish uh, foreign minister, uh, <laughs> can you imagine? They're even telling him that they're going to wipe out the people of Tigray. It's incredible. I mean, they, 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 this is self incriminating in the court of international law, self-incriminating. They are actually going to be, uh, if they come before the ICC, the International Criminal Court, they're going to tell them, you said it yourself. You are going to eliminate the people of Tigray. But they can't do it. You see, the thing is, uh, uh, always it happened. It happened to the Jewish people to the, uh, in Rwanda as well, in many, many places. People are not, you're not going to wipe out all people. It's impossible. You can kill thousands of people for sure. You can do that. They've done it already in Tigray. But the people of Tigray are resilient. They are really incredible people. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I happen to be uh, a Tigrayan by accident. You too, Barakat. We did not design to become Tigrayans. <laughs> no one can do that. However, I'm really proud of the people of Tigray because they're resilient, they're strong people, morally strong people. Uh, they, still, they still are uh, uh, not only of hope, but they have this special stamina that they're going to win the war. So it may happen. Uh, yet today, I was watching an Ethiopian television. I always watch it, by the way. Although I don't like it, I watch it. And then they were celebrating in... Uh, in Olkait Sagade, number one for returning it, and the guy who was uh, celebrating with them was the Mecca, uh, Zodu, Zodu the Mecca, <laughs> who was a member of the TPLF, who is from Olkait, of course. And they said the fact that we got back, Olkait Sagade is great, blah, blah, all those things. They were dancing, they were having 
they were waving Ethiopian flags with no star inside it, the flat Ethiopian flag. And then Eritrean flag too. Can you imagine now? So Eritrea is much closer to them than Tigray. <laughs> Yeah, that's the uh, irony. Yeah, I know I heard uh, the same thing uh, today. Yeah. The uh, Tigray Defense Forces uh, routed them, the uh, Eritrean and uh, uh, the Eritrean, the Ethiopian, the Amhara militia, whatnot, from their fortified uh, defense positions. Uh, uh, and they are in this array as this movement. Maybe the beginning of. Uh, the victory uh, because as you have said uh, stamina gut determination love of a people and love of a country is the environment of the Tagal. there is no doubt about that throughout the history so it is only a matter of time when but the victory is always gonna be coming sooner mm -hmm. better so I agree with you, and uh, I, uh, just like any Tigray, I am proud who we are and who we became, especially at this stage, uh, rallying around the world from uh, corners of the world to speak on behalf of our people, and especially uh, a great service, the youth, the youth uh, that we didn't invest so much, they are investing more on us and on their country. And that's one of these highlight things uh, as a result of the you know, ongoing war uh, that's worked by Abiy Ahmed. Uh, one thing that uh, you brought, uh, uh, Santan, Gregory Santan, I call him yeah. Gregory Satan. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah. honestly, and I know we wrote, uh, both of us, uh, rejecting the notion of uh, his uh, uh, assertion. Uh, I remember the word, Tigrians are going to pay uh, for what yes. is going on right now. Uh, you know, to tell you quite frank, uh, it looks like a prophecy. It happened. You know, it happened. <laughs> uh, we should have taken it seriously. I know you and me, we condemned it. Uh, yeah. From our own organization, who claims to watch genocide, he is pushing for genocide, and that's what exactly he has done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to his point, it happened, and we didn't take it seriously. Had we taken it seriously, we would. And those people who were uh, on the audience was uh, some fascist, uh, chauvinist elites of uh, this region. Uh, they were uh, gaggling and they were cheering. And uh, that was really the sad movement as an Ethiopian back then, that the Ethiopians are cheering exactly what is happening right now when Tigrians are, uh, when Tigrian mom, sisters, and the daughters are being raped, being starved to death, being killed, systematic killing of our young. And they were cheering. And this Ethiopianism is wrapped with power hungry maniacs and chauvinists who are using that Ethiopianism as a platform to satisfy their ego and power. It is void. There is no connection. It is not in my soul. It is not in anybody's Tagal soul. We died for Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is killing us in terms of, you know, no compassion. You know, the whole world is uh, sad. What's going on in Tigray? In Ethiopia, they are cheering up to this stage. And I haven't seen, except few politicians like uh, Ludetu and others, who condemn what's going on in Tigray. And they publicly, after all this dust rests, how do they feel Tagaro to be? part of this genocidal state called Ethiopia, who invited their neighbors, never sovereign country to participate in killing fields. How do you reconcile? How do 
any Ethiopia reconciles this, you know, to call us Tagaru as an Ethiopia. And that is really a challenge for me and for others. I don't have the in feeling. I don't know how they're going to cultivate. What I'm worried is about future to grow. But all of us, especially the, gener the, the generation. In the light of this, uh, Professor, how do you see the future of Tigray coming from this ash to be a development that state and democratic, de democratic state? Mm -hmm. you know, setbacks in putting in democratization and multi-party system. Is there any lesson that you're going to be taught? Okay. That's interesting. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and uh, we're going to see it uh, from different angles so that our uh, audience can have a good understanding of what we're talking about. But anyway, before I do that, uh, two things that uh, have to be uh, <clears throat> corrected. The one he said about uh, Gregory Stanton, a prophecy, a prophecy, that prophecy should be quote unquote. Yes. You know why? Because it was not a prophecy to me. Uh, it was a pre-planned, meditated, meditated, like pre-planned, meditated murder. A murderer who plans to murder somebody has planned ahead of time. You don't need prophecy for that, okay? So, but, but we say from as a maxim, actually, we just say prophecy and all those things. But they were planning ahead of time. That's what I, I want to say, actually. It's a long time plan. It's not just Gregory. You know, many of them were talking about that. For 10 years, the Assad television have said that against the grass, okay? Mm. The other thing, of course, is... Uh, which is going to be very controversial, I understand. I understand now the current psychology of the people of Tigray. They are bittered. The people of Tigray are extremely bittered. Me too. You too, by the way. All of us. We have this Tigray Global Advocacy Group that you and I do every Sunday. We are all bittered. However, sometimes we have to make a distinction between a country and a political system. Abiy Ahmed is not Ethiopia to me. Abi Ahmed is not an Ethiopia. He just says Ethiopia and all those things, but that's all fake. He just wants to stay in power. And he contradicts himself. A couple of days ago, he said in Jumma, we, we really don't care about Ethiopia. When he came back to Addis Ababa, he was talking about the unity of Ethiopia and all those things. It's all fake, actually, really. So Ethiopia is a country. It used to be a country. It's a country. The political systems are the ones that are responsible for the genocide and for everything. Abiy's political system, Dirk's political system, the emperor's political systems, and what have you. So... If now we begin to see in the context of the difference between the country and the political system, I can now easily analyze the future of Tigray. What is going to be? Okay, this is what's going to happen. I have already defined this in many, many meetings and discussions. Uh, I think the people of Tigray have now three choices as far as I'm concerned. The first choice is, by the way, it's not just, for, as far as I'm concerned, the uh, uh, number one enemy is the government of, uh, government of Abiy, so-called Prosperity Party, and the Amahara militia. These are the number one deadly enemies of Tigray. But I don't see other Ethiopian people as enemies of Tigray. The Afar people, except for the guy who is now president of Afar, 
regional state, who is also a, a friend of Abi. The majority of the Afar people do have a <coughs> positive attitude toward Tigray. The, uh, the, the people who are fighting in, in Romia have also the same attitude towards Tigray. In fact, they have respect to the people of Tigray. They even told us once, we could not have had self-determination and an Oromia uh, 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 regional state without the sacrifice of the people of Tigray. Uh, you remember the, the president of Somalia who is now in prison, the former one? Abdi. Abdi Muhammad. He said, without the sacrifice of the people of Tigray, we could have not gotten the freedom we have gained now. And then he said the present constitution should continue and the present uh, federal structure should continue. They put him behind bars. Okay? The Somali people are also in favor of Tigray. The majority of the Ethiopian people, except for the Amara militia and the elite Amara, are actually really in. Uh, so if you now uh, consider what I just said, the one possibility is uh, uh, the government of Tigray that's now in the, in the, in the jungle uh, can uh, work out some kind of political program with uh, various uh, federalist forces in Ethiopia to bring the downfall of Abiy Ahmed and then create a new Ethiopia. This is one option. Many people may not like it, but I'm going to put them as options because a political scientist comes with options, not just with one option, okay? This is one. With Federalist forces, the Tigrayan forces, put down Abiy Ahmed, eliminate him from power, and then restructure a new Ethiopia. The second choice is uh, Tigray should have... Uh, greater autonomy to Gray by itself and then Oromia by itself and Afar by itself and others by itself. Uh, and then this, uh, these forces can actually join in a confederal system, confederation, okay? This is one choice. They are in relatively independent states, but they have a confederal state that actually, uh, in terms of defense and trade and what have you, uh, you have to have a greater autonomy. The third option is to declare uh, an independent Tigray, Tigray Republic, okay? The majority of the people of Tigray would actually choose the last one, I believe, under the current situation. <laughs> However, that, 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 that has to be, uh, that has to be analyzed in the context of global economy and all those things. There's so many things that are gonna come. So we cannot say now this is the only one choice. We have to come up with different choices and we will see how it grows. That's how I see it. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think uh, in the panel analysis uh, as uh, a dedicated and intellectual, uh, always there is a perspective of uh, different choices. Uh, there is there is no one that fits for all. Uh, we are talking about sinners. Yeah. And mm -hmm. sinners are, the way you put it, in, in a very perspective, uh, citing history and also citing the global uh, world uh, political order, order that we are talking about in the light of this. Uh, what uh, really the final analysis is depends on what the people of the ground want. And that is the bottom line. You know, whatever the choice, uh, if the people of the ground spoken for any peaceful desire of a future Republic of the ground, so be it. But the final analysis, as I indicated, uh, always you give choices. Those are the choices. Those are the perspectives. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, evaluate, educate, and uh, uh, we should not be uh, driven by emotion and sheer 
ignorance, but but factual world order and history and you know present and the future, and then we'll have a, a very knowledgeable, educated guess on what we want on our future of our Tigray. And I believe we should speak openly about this issue, you know, uh, because uh, I think starting uh, today, uh, even yesterday, we should entertain such uh, ideas, uh, educating the public, you know, what choices we have, you know, instead of uh, being propelled by emotion. Uh, I think uh, we should be based on science, based on historical analysis and a political world order. You know, it's always uh, uh, you put your judgment in the light of those uh, uh, understand the global uh, world order and economy as well. This is a time when, as you know, Europeans are coming together with all the ch historical challenges they have fighting. And there is no, uh, you know, in human history where so many war has fought as much as in Europe, as far as I'm concerned. First World War, Second World War. It is about yeah. political hegemony and uh, about political economy, all those wars. So if those people are coming together, I think in the light of this, uh, uh, we can have something that benefit us, whether, you know, having good neighbors with Sudan or uh, other, uh, you know, or even with Eritrea, uh, for that matter. This is a regime uh, that has uh, created so much havoc and war, not only in Tigray, it is in Yemen, in Djibouti, in Sudan, all the areas that is adjacent to its borders. So uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I believe that uh, we should be able, you know, to discuss this issue uh, because it affects us seriously. Yeah. And of uh, thoughtful uh, ideas, uh, we start uh, right now. Uh, to have a clear vision for our future, what ought to be the right. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, harshly, you know, sometimes quickly driven by emotion, uh, if you can put uh, our thoughts, uh, then uh, it will be a very disastrous. Uh, at any rate, uh, I enjoyed uh, uh, our conversation. I think uh, the time is uh, getting a little yeah. bit late yeah. on your side. <laughs> we have three hours difference, so yeah, it is, uh, it is uh, up to. Uh, we can we can we can conclude this in about five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the final analysis, uh, I just want to say this, uh, uh, professor, to you, and uh, you have done those series uh, of historical analysis, uh, as I said, starting from 1600 up to now. And, uh, I hope. Uh, a lot of cyber power followers uh, have gotten so much uh, enlightenment uh, and also they will push uh, their own uh, reading historical materials uh, because this is not uh, enough, but it gives direction which way forward uh, historical uh, analysis based on the current and past. So what is your thought uh, to have a continuity, such kind of discussion in the future, uh, how to benefit, especially as a young uh, generation here in the diaspora, as you have to try to look for the fact that uh, you already started with a, a group uh, before it was interrupted uh, by this unfortunate yeah, yeah. war. So how are we going to... Um, Propose this uh, in every state, uh, in every country, in Europe, in Australia, and others, because I see a value in it. Yeah, the, when, what do they have to do is uh, the Tigran diaspora has to organize some kind of program and then invite uh, intellectual scholars. Uh, it could be weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Uh, it doesn't have to be every week, as a matter of fact. And then discuss history. Uh, the, the, there is no history is uh, uh, history is really a guide to the future, as I 
said early on when we started out today. Because if you don't know your history, you don't know anything really. For those people who are uh, who are born in the diaspora and you grew up uh, here in the diaspora, some of them don't speak the language of their parents. They don't know the culture of Tigray. They don't know the history of Tigray. So they should know all the stamps. Otherwise, uh, they can claim that they are from that part of the world, but they don't have anything from that part of the world. And it's our job, our responsibility. If we don't do that, we're going to really do disservice to our children in the diaspora. So that's what I say, whether you're in Australia or Europe, it doesn't matter, in Canada or the United States. You can actually come up with it. They are so simple, so easy to organize. All you have to do is, uh, there are so many Tigrayan scholars, by the way, historians that I know myself. There are so many Tigrayan scholars who have written so many books so they can share their ideas and thoughts with the uh, diaspora young people. But the last uh, thing I want to say is uh, anything can happen in the near future with respect to the destiny of Tigray. So before that happens, again, we have to learn from history. Now, if they can listen to this program, I want to convey a message to the leadership in Tigray, which is the government of Tigray in the jungle. Uh, anything can happen. Therefore, they have to prepare the people of Tigray for a referendum. A referendum has to come this time. Not a person like myself, intellectual, a politician or an elite should decide for the people of Tigray. The people of Tigray should decide this time. You have to be given a chance to, they have to have a say too in the decision-making process. That's very important. It's gonna be part of history if we do that. So while we teach our diaspora people, we have to guide our brothers and sisters back home as well by just making inputs. Uh, my advice it could be a two penny words advice, but it's important nonetheless, important, because uh, there was some problem with uh, leadership uh, uh, of uh, not listening. It's good to listen to people. It's also good to implement those ad advices. They are important. The people of Tigray unfortunately have uh, sacrificed so much and never in their history they have had such kind of encounter or deal never i mean you can you can, you can see all the, those things i mentioned haile selassie and Derg and what have you this is incredible unheard of in history at all never in the history of tigray but this is going to come and go it's going to go too so the people of tigray are going to enjoy the peace and stability they have had. This is gonna come for sure. I, I have no doubt in my mind. Uh, so that's what we have to do. I mean, uh, what else can we do, you know? I do. So, uh, uh, I thank you so much for this program. And whatever you say now, you close it, Mr. Barakat. Uh, I do share your thoughts. Tigray has never seen such cruelty uh, in the history. This is like this. There are so many challenges, so many wars, but not to the level of uh, such uh, diabolic leaders uh, who are boasting to diplomats uh, whip out uh, Tigrayans uh, from their existence. It's just mind boggling. What kind of state of mind such reckless officials will talk to a diplomatic son with such kind of talk? It's just unimaginable, even to regard them as human beings. This is where we are. And uh, the world should not. Those who call themselves uh, leaders, they are nothing but 
evils. Nothing but evils. They don't deserve to live in such a deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, 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 I understand your concern. And it is all our concern. So on behalf of the cyber power of Tigray and its sub followers, uh, thank you, Professor Galaudius. I appreciated uh, your candid uh, uh, discussion uh, in lighting uh, the diaspora community. And uh, for many of us uh, that uh, we cherish uh, your presence and uh, your stamina uh, in the <laughs> life of all those. Uh, <laughs> you know, I understand you've been uh, in every show and, uh, you know, it's it's so hard to navigate, you know, your personal and professional life. And also when you are called, you know, I know I have known you over 25 years. You don't say no. And uh, that takes uh, its toll on health, and I hope uh, you can take care of yourself. Uh, we need you more, uh, and uh, I wish you your health and well-being, and also uh, you will have a space, not only in our mind, but <laughs> in the future of Tigray as well. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Galadius. Thank you uh, for coming for Sakharov. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, a pleasure actually, really. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.